welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Roger Remington, a Vignelli professor here, and we're uh, very happy to have you all here for our uh, monthly Design Conversations lecture series, which happens to coincide with the Norman Ives exhibit. I uh, told my students that if they came tonight, I'd give them extra credit. And I just uh, had one student sign in in the back, and he told me that he didn't have anything else to do, so he came. <laughs> But uh, we're very, uh, very pleased to have, uh, have our panelists. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, all those involved in supporting the Norman Ives exhibit. It's been a, a busy and hectic but wonderful week uh, with all this great work. And uh, we're so happy that you're all here and can join us tonight in this great event. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, not only welcome you, but to uh, uh, toss the ball to our um, mod panel moderator, Ann Gory Goodman. By the way, Roger is amazing. He is a visionary historian, and you can't get better than that. Um, one of the things we're trying, <laughs> one of the things, uh, one of the things we do here in the Vignelli Center is we talk about legacy, and we talk about influence, and we talk about inspiration. So we thought that in addition to seeing all this work that Norman Ives has done, you should get a feeling for the person from people who have known him in various capacities. So um, today we're going to have John Hill, Dennis Ichiyama, Jack Weiss, and Tom Strong each tell you something about Norman in the way that he might, may have affected uh, you. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, John Hill, and he, as an undergraduate at the University of Georgia, studied painting, design, and photography, and received a BFA in design and an MFA in painting. After a tour of infantry duty, he continued graduate studies in design and photography at the Yale School of Art and Architecture, which I think everybody on the panel has done. On graduating, he was asked to join the Yale faculty teaching both graphic design and photography, and he was one of my teachers. His faculty colleagues from the 1960s and 70s included Alvin Eisenman, Walker Evans, Herbert Matter, Norman Ives, Bradbury Thompson, and Paul Rand. Photography had been an integral part of Yale's graphic design department from its beginning in 1951. 20 years later, with photography's increased president presence in the arts, Alvin Eisenman and John Hill founded Yale's first department of photography, making it independent from its parent graphic design. Hill served as the department's first director of graduate studies in photography, and three years before his death, Walker Evans asked Hill to serve as executor of his estate. His commitment to legacy and influence led to the design of many exhibitions by luminaries we all know, including the show we have here today. And thank you very much for all those <laughs> overextended words. Um, I don't think we've really said enough about Roger, and I'd like to say a few more words. He really is our hero, and he is our preserver, and He's created a capsule of what we uh, once call graphic design, and I don't think that we can underestimate that because it, it's not only capturing the design, but it is capturing an awful lot of social history about wars we fought, about uh, things we bought and sold and all our causes. And, and I think that his persistence and his uh, durability over the last 40 years is something that really is a great treasure for all of us. And then I would also like to thank RIT for recognizing that in Roger and keeping him well and dry, and, and also for letting us show Norman Ives, who I believe was very underexposed in his lifetime, and I'm hoping that we can bring some light on that. Um, Norman was a formalist as Joseph Albers, his teacher before him. And we were talking this week about that with several of uh, people who knew Norman and some who also knew Albers. And I think that 
that background and that understanding of form and appreciation of form is something that we find in Norman and we find so rarely in a lot of people who call themselves graphic designers today. And I think that that, if anything, sets him apart. But also, if you spread the entire body of his work out, you'll find that maybe 20% of that is something you might call applied design or applied art. But he invested in that the same sort of sophistication and understanding of form that he did in his collages and his paintings and his sculptures. And I think that's a very important thing. He took great joy in making the symbols. He took joy in making posters. And they were as well thought out and as well um, planned as any of his collages, although maybe not as um, intricate. He, um, in 1971, to show you the breadth of his career and his influence, he had an, a part of a three-man exhibition sponsored by the Museum of Modern Art with Massimo Vignelli and Almir, Almir Maravigna. And that traveled broadly across the country. In this same year, 1971, Norman Ives had a painting that he had made exhibited by the Whitney Museum in their annual exhibition or their biannual exhibition. So you see, even then, he was recognized both as a fine artist and as a designer. And I think, in a way, he never saw the difference in that. In the same way that Herbert Matter and uh, Joseph Albers and Paul Rand and other, and other designers are able to sort of claim that distinction because their, their, their work really is just as sophisticated and just as important to the overall culture as their fine art. Um, I want to point out to you that <clears throat> we've laid out the exhibition in two ways. The Bevier Gallery has all his original, all the material in there is original work except for the large murals. In, in the beginning, I think there may have been the collages. When he was at Wesleyan studying, he was doing fairly conventional painting. But you could see in the printmaking that he was doing, he was interested in printing and um, graphics. And he was also interested in classical Greece and, and Rome. And that infused a lot of his thinking and a lot of his aesthetic over the years. But it's hard to know exactly when he took up collage. But I believe that it's. Uh, one strong indication is that he took it up in Albers' class because Albers was a great lover of letters and form and printing, and he appreciated it very much. So Albers had purposely set up a print shop as one of the first things he did, and he considered that as important as his painting studio. So there was a print shop, but also Albers was assigning uh, drawing classes where letter forms and numerals were being drawn as forms, and they were also being drawn as texture and lines and cutting and pasting were a part of that whole environment at the time. So I think you, you can naturally assume that that led to a lot of Norman's uh, process. Uh, the paintings, the, the, I think the collage may have led to the silkscreen images, but the letter seemed to have been his um, foundation from the very beginning. In the very beginning, the, the um, collages were letter forms that he'd obviously, he would spread out an entire alphabet on a Vandercook press and make large sheets of type. And he would cut them into s squares that were really fragments of letters. And that fragmenting of letter forms really became the strokes of all of his paintings and all of his works. It later became even more fragmented because the squares became triangles and then the triangles became uh, more complicated, and then finally he was, in some of the prints, taking the letter fragments and further fragmenting them by adding a series of stripes over them. So it became more and more complex as, as time went on. The mural in the back of this room, which I think is really a masterpiece, uh, was made from a silkscreen print, and that's an example of there are very subtle references to letter forms there, but it's, it's beginning to be harder and harder to find specific letter forms. Whereas almost all of these silkscreen prints and the, and the embossing and stamping, they refer to letter forms. The 
cutting of the letter forms was a sort of detour, it was a detour from that in a series that he did where he, he loved letter ga word games and letter games and crossword puzzles and all that. And in the, uh, the farthest one in the right corner there, the red, black, and ivory one, he um, made um, a print by overlaying letters. And I spent um, quite a few hours trying to figure out what that might spell. And I finally figured out it might spell horse, the word horse, and it might spell man. And then there was an O that was left over. So I thought, horse, O oh man. And then I happened to look down and see the title of this print, which was Centaur. And I thought, what an idiot. I mean, if, if you'd looked at that, <laughs> you would have known what he was up to from the beginning. But it was another reference to his love of classic literature. Um, the, the range of the work and the range of the, the wit and the mood of the work is also extraordinary. You see him going from very um, deep, dark, close values into uh, things that are much brighter and joyous. And uh, in the other room, there's a piece called Spring, and it's a, a silkscreen print, but it really began as a collage. But it's sort of a joyous, whimsical, sort of witty thing. But then you'll find things that are dark and, I won't say depressing, but they're very deep and, and dark and the same thing. It, his own mood range, of course, varied greatly, and I think it was reflected in his, uh, in his work. Um, I'm uh, pleased that we were able to get as much diversity, and I must thank a number of people for that. Number one, the Ives family, who opened up all their uh, treasures and allowed us to choose from that. Uh, Tom Strong, who not only opened up his, his wonderful generosity and his loan and his support of this whole thing, and without Tom, it would have been an impossible thing to do. We're looking forward to continuing the thing. We now have enough material to easily do a show two or three times the size of this without, I think, that much repetition. We're hoping that the book that's coming will help further you know, give more depth to that. And the foundation uh, which John Ives has succeeded in setting up is collecting funds toward that book. And we hope that not only collectors, but donors and former students of his will find some way to contribute large or small amounts to that foundation. There are some, uh, some small cards here that John Ives has produced that I think have all the information on it, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Anyway, um, I'm so pleased to have been a part of this. It's a, it's a long time coming, and I hope, um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Next up. Oh, I'll just stand up like this. <laughs> uh, the next person who will be speaking is Dennis Ichiyama. And sorry, this one's not doing well. Uh, a professor, Dennis Ichiyama, is currently a faculty member in the Visual Communications Design Program at Purdue University. His area of research and creative endeavors printing and historical typography. His latest project includes a collaboration with the Institute of Design, Instituto Superior de Diseño in Havana, Cuba, which culminated in the first joint poster exhibition between students in Cuba and America. Okay, so just, there's one missing. Up on the 
Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to also add my thanks to uh, John and Roger for having this event. As I was saying to uh, John prior to him coming up here, I've waited 50 years for this. So it finally arrived. But uh, I had three things planned according to the schedule there, their pre-Yale period, at Yale, and after Yale. But as I was coming on the airplane, I remember that uh, it's almost Thanksgiving, and one of the things I remember fondly, and by the way, all my reminiscences will be stories, and they'll be very short stories, but very meaningful to me. As a student from Hawaii in 1966, I was the class of 68, uh, <clears throat> Norman said, came in the studio and said, uh, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? And I said, well, nothing, nothing probably. So he invited me to his home uh, with another foreign student. I was considered foreign because I was from Hawaii. <laughs> The other student was from Turkey, and uh, I just found out, unfortunately, that he had passed today. Well, but anyway, Norman took us in, and we had what I consider a Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving. It was really great. Now, I'm told that some of the sons are here. When I was there having dinner at the home with Connie, and there were very small children, uh, too numerous. I, I think they introduced us, but uh, I just seem to forget. I hope I'll have a chance to meet them. Uh, one or two of them look very familiar, and I thought this was a deja vu thing all over again. But that's the uh, <clears throat> story I wanted to just, uh, because of the time of the year, that I was so welcomed into his home, had a great Thanksgiving. and But let me start with uh, pre-Yale. Now, 50 years ago, uh, I was in Hawaii. Norman came and was going to offer that in that summer of 65 a workshop. And uh, one or two of my teachers said, oh, you should take this. It'll be very fascinating, very interesting. It'll be about design and all. So I said, fine. A workshop is uh, about four or five weeks. So I took it, and I remember him coming in the first day. And uh, I, I don't remember him, but I remember what he was bringing in with him, which is this very large box. And he put it down on the table, and for the next five or six weeks, we were introduced to the interaction of color. I think Norman took that sabbatical, I think two years or three years after the publication of the interaction of color, and he couldn't have picked a better place to, to do his sabbatical in Hawaii. I think there was a connection with his dad who was uh, in the Navy, and I guess he may have uh, been in Hawaii before, but that was my first introduction to Norman, taking that course, which was the most unusual course in color I had ever taken. And no brushes, no paints, no water, it was just with paper. And uh, I remember one other thing, this will be rather interesting, he asked me, I, apparently I did well because I passed it, and he asked me, were you planning to continue your education? And I said, well, yes, funny you should mention it. I have an application out, and uh, I'm going to be applying uh, to the school in Pasadena. And he said, oh, had you thought about possibly looking into Yale? And I said, well, no, not really. Uh, but he said, you know, you might give it some thought. Now we're going to go forward to 1966. Here I am at Yale. By the way, I, I didn't get accepted to Art Center. So uh, Yale got me on the, on the rebound. I did finally send in the application because Hawaii had a history of two previous uh, students from Hawaii going there. One, uh, two of them I knew, uh, and they said, yeah, you must look into it seriously. Why don't you just send your application? Well, in those days, sending an application meant the portfolio, and the portfolio meant building a crate, which was then shipped, and uh, I, the box, uh, plywood box was made and shipped. And uh, so, I'm going to fast forward to my time at Yale, and, and this is one evening in the basement of the a and building. Uh, we were, it was a weekday. Norman came in with someone and said, I'd like to introduce you to this former graduate from the uh, graphic design program who's here 
uh, hoping to recruit people who might want to teach. And, um, you know, we, we met, we talked. Uh, this was in the basement. Uh, it was after class. And the only thing I remember this and, uh, person is that he had a book that had just come out. And he had a book there. It was a Van Nostrand and Reinhold book. And he said, uh, you know, this is some research that I did while I was at Yale, and I continued it. And it was American wood type. Little did I know at that time, I just looked at the book and said, what wood type? Oh my God, um, no. It was a hardback Van Nostrand Reinhold book, which was rather expensive. So as a Yale student uh, from Hawaii, an international student, I didn't have the money to buy it. But later on, I did get it. And uh, it played a rather significant part in my life later on. And uh, let's see, which do I press? The one at the bottom? While I was at uh, the Hamilton Museum, which had just opened up in 1999, I, I said, I'd like to get involved with printing. So they, uh, so they permitted me to come to the uh, uh, museum, the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, and I went there, had just opened in, the, in May of 1999, and uh, the other auspicious thing was on that date, when it was supposed to open, which was the 27th of May, 1999. The governor was gonna come. The all Wisconsin marching band was there in, in May in, in wool uh, marching uniform. But then they had to cancel it for some reason. The governor could not make it. So they had it the next day, which was fine. But the next day was rather auspicious because it happened to be my birthday. So I went into the opening and I said to the people who were in charge, I said, you know, this is something special. The fact that you had to cancel this opening and have it open on the 28th, I have to come here and I have to use the facilities and if you can invite me to come, come in and use the hundreds and thousands of wood types, that would be fantastic. And they said, sure, why don't you come in as a resident designer? I was at Purdue going to Two Rivers, Wisconsin, was almost five hours on the uh, Tri-State and going up. So I did, and for about 10 to 12 years, I was making four or five trips a year for about a week, taking a student to come with me. I paid for all the expenses, and the student was supposed to do all the cleanup work for me, except we left on a Sunday, returned on a Sunday, and I would print from Monday to Thursday. But then on Friday, I said to the student, this is your day. You can print whatever you want. By then, they had seen what I was doing, so they, they, they knew how to not hurt themselves or uh, ruin the wood type. Uh, so, so that's how it worked out. And I, when I was there, this is a portfolio of prints that were done with wood type. And Again, when I was at Hamilton, I had this wonderful opportunity to just print. I had no clients, I had no galleries, no one was saying, we gotta sell your work. So I was just printing for the sake of printing. And if it didn't go well, that's fine. I have stuff at home that goes from floor to ceiling that never saw the light of day. Well, I'm gonna rush off because there's some more stuff. Oh, that's one of the prints, and they're all wood type that I found that were already broken, and I just cut them so they got a more clean edge. Uh, the next series is part of this collage that, that's here. When I was at Yale, we did cut paper, and many years later, I was in Indiana, and I, was, I did a billboard, and the company that put up the billboard said, uh, would you like a copy of your billboard that's up on the interstate? And I said, sure, so I got this thing that was all folded up, and uh, I opened it up, and these were paper billboards from the uh, early 90s, automobile cigarettes, and they were all folded, and they were gonna throw them away. So I went back and forth to the company that put the billboards up, and I got them, and the billboards were huge, but I only took the typographic portion of the billboards, and then started to play with them. Again, having no clients, having no schedule, I just did them 
to suit whatever I felt. Billboards, right? That's the uh, that's that's a little book we made, paperback book, and those are some of the prints in there, and uh, these are the billboards. So these were all cut up and uh, were made into collages. They were so much fun. I show them frequently. I made the book, and the book I give to people who sort of have a sympathy for me or empathy for billboards. Of course, billboards are no longer paper billboards. You can't get the paper ones. And I have a garage full, so this is a work in progress. So when I leave the university or the academy, I have stuff to do. And I think that's why I was kind of, it was interesting because Norman's picture was behind that. I kept thinking, oh my God, he's still looking back. So Norman, if you're around, I will continue, I will continue the work with collage and uh, the billboards and uh, hopefully have fun. I don't care if, I, if people never see them again, but it's really for me. Thank you very much. Next up is Jack Weiss. Jack is a principal of Jack Weiss Associates in Chicago. And since forming that firm in 1977, Jack has directed over 400 major projects ranging from printed communi communications and visual identity programs to signage and wayfinding systems. His professional career spans a period of over 40 years and he has been an advocate for designers and design in Chicago for decades. Jack. Yeah, keep it from going to sleep. Thank you, Ann. Would the two Ives brothers please stand up? Which way? Okay, all right. Yeah, thanks. I'm not a great extemporaneous speaker, so I'm going to read from my short and brief script. <clears throat> In 2004, I was accepted as an adjunct teaching, uh, uh, a teaching position at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, the beginning type course, as I designed it, was heavily influenced by my Yale experience, and especially by Norman Ives. I began each semester with an introductory PowerPoint presentation to explain why I love typography and what influenced the pedagogy of my class. I displayed examples of the typographic work of people like Paul Clay, Saul Bass, Walker Evans, um, Norman Ives, and, uh, and Stuart Davis. Um, then I showed the students some of my early work, in particular one Yale project that was assigned by Norman that expresses the formal, I call it architectural, qualities of type. Uh, in this little study, this is, this is actually about six by six inches, a paragraph out of a Time magazine, I think it was, where uh, we looked at uh, what letters are made of. And uh, in the days when we had cotolith and opaquing, uh, opaquing fluid, uh, we could take images like this and select bits and pieces of them. And so in this case, selected the, uh, the round parts of letter forms. But obviously, there are diagonal parts of letter forms. There are uh, horizontal parts. There are vertical parts. And um, it was my, one of my first experiences through Norman to see letters as pieces of architecture, as form, pure form. Um, the first beginning type project, Fragments, um, involved creating four four-inch high letters, and of course in this era we were using uh, computers and generating digital type, 
Uh, but the letters were in sans serif and serif form, quartering them and reassembling them in collage, a classic Norman Ives project um, that examines the formal qualities of type in both serif and sans serif aspects. Even in this abstract form, students began to see how serif and sans serif influence formal letter forms. So these are four-inch high letters that are quartered and then simply reassembled in an either an intentional form or totally random form. Um, I allowed my students 20 different typefaces, that's exclusively 20 different typefaces. They had a list that they could choose from. They thought it was terribly limiting. I thought it was very, very educational. So uh, I forget which, which typeface this is. But here's a funky serif typeface. I think we all know that one. Um, the second project, so this, this went on for uh, two or three weeks, looking at these pieces and crying out, oh, that's an A, that's a K, that's an R, that's an E, that's a lowercase C, that's an uppercase H. Uh, you, can, you can see there's a, there's a lowercase G, there's an uppercase G. There's a Q. We got into tales of Qs, ad infinitum. Tales and Qs are beautiful. So uh, they started discovering these pieces of letter forms through this exercise. Um, second project, letter forms, <clears throat> involved setting the phrase, a quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. All of you typographers and educators know what that phrase represents. <clears throat> I won't explain it. But uh, the limitation was only 96 point Futura uh, in both upper and lower case. Uh, I chose Futura for a simple reason, because it has a, um, it's influenced by the Bauhaus. My undergraduate work was at the Institute of Design uh, Bauhaus. And um, it, emulated, it, it came out of the Bauhaus, obviously. So students could explore the, the classic geometrical qualities of uh, letter forms. And in today's digital world, students can access more than a, more than a dozen Futura versions. Uh, and they can letter space and line space uh, to enormous advantage on the computer. Uh, so in that exercise, they were able to do things like this. Uh, they were given no, no instruction about letter spacing or line spacing, uh, but simply had to use a version of Futura in capital, in capital letters and a version of, version of Futura in lowercase letters. So they could begin to see and distinguish between what uppercase letters look like and what lowercase letters look like, and to see the geometry in these letters. Um, I often ride my bike on the Green Bay, Green Bay Trail in Chicago's north suburbs. Um, it's a trails to rails, I'm sorry, rails to trails, a uh, trail built on the North Shore, uh, north Shore Line shoreline route that went from uh, Evanston's Church Street Station to Milwaukee until about the early 60s. Uh, the electric trains, um, traveled at speeds of 100 miles an hour in the 20s. It was remarkable. Uh, as you ride that Green Bay Trail, um, you see uh, artifacts of the, of the line. You see the old stations, the, the pedestals of the platforms are still there, the Art Deco steel railings of the bridges, the concrete detailing on some of the bridges are all still there from that, uh, from that line. Um, as I explained to, um, oh, so I, um, I created a new public art piece in Evanston on the 100th anniversary of the North Shore lines, uh, uh, line from Evanston to Milwaukee, and it was just dedicated last Thursday uh, to celebrate its 100th anniversary. As I explained to the curious, the mural um, is an abstraction of this. Uh, believe it or not, these were the official colors of the North Shore line, green and red. So the electroliners were green and red, and pretty much this color of green and red. Um, I took the logo and did the Norman Ives thing to it. I, I, I eliminated the wild uh, rectangular background, isolated the letter forms, and um, diced it and spliced it and put it back together and created this um, concept informed by the work of, of Norman Ives. Um, the letters in the logo are cut into 24 inch squares and then rotated, each, each letter rotated 90 degrees clockwise. Uh, so the tribute to Norman Ives now resides in my hometown. That piece is uh, six, by tw six by 18 feet. It's made from, uh, Tom asked me, it's made from uh, 
I-Zone, which is a signage design, signage material, uh, half-inch thick uh, acrylic polyresin with a digital image embedded in it, so it's completely UV resistant and completely uh, uh, resistant to uh, vandalism. Um, even before I did this one, however, uh, we have a new, uh, well, it's no longer new. You've, maybe you've heard of the 606 line in Chicago, the, the, high the high line of Chicago that runs for two and a half miles uh, on the near north side. Um, they're about ready to start funding this public art component of the trail, but the trail's been in place now for almost two years. I proposed this in 2002, uh, I'm sorry, 2012, uh, to the Trust for Public Land. Um, if accepted, if accepted, and I hope it will be within the year, uh, it'll be this, my second tribute to Norman, uh, seen by thousands of people who explore the 606 trail. Um, this is uh, the typeface of the Chicago and Pacific Railroad that used that freight line, and it's Clarendon. Some of you may recognize the typeface, but it's one that Norman has used in many of his works. But Clarendon was the official mid-1980s typeface of the time, and so that's what they were using then. And that's my second tribute to Norman Eyes. Thank you. Where's Tom? Oh. <laughs> Tom Strong studied with Norman Ives. John Hill, Paul Rand, Herbert Matter, Brad Washburn, Sewell Silman, Dieter Rowe, and Red Grooms in the two-year MFA program at Yale, which had been conceived by Alvin Eisenman. In 1968, Tom Strong and Marjorie Gordon started the Strong Cohen design firm in New Haven. He inspired legions of Yale graduate students who worked in his shop, including me. <laughs> Designers from across the globe made pilgrimages to New Haven to see Tom's extraordinary poster collection and hear his stories about the people who made them. A number of pieces in the Norman Ives exhibit here are on loan from Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, can we put up the first yep. portrait of Norman? I wish to point out that Red Grooms tried to flunk me, and dear Alvin Eisman found a way to give me a passing grade, a true gift. Um, I may stand here so I can, if you can't hear me, let me know. Norman in 1966, maybe 65, the photographer is here, so Esther can correct me. 64. In the crib room, the chap leaning over Norman's shoulder is sitting in the front row. He's too modest to stand up and take a bow. A crisp woman. And behind him to the right is Arthur Conkin, a classmate of Esther and Mrs., and a classmate of mine. Norman he is smoking a can. You see the pack. And I will point out in those days, we expected ashes to fall on our work. Everyone but Alvin Eisen was smoking class. And no one thought it was odd or unusual or unhealthy, as far as I know. Um, Chris is looking at work on the table that he can no longer recognize. He remembers whether it was his or just what. But that was the nature of a crib at Yale in those years. You would do your work each week, the teacher, or each twice a week, would say, lay it out, clean it up on the wall, and let's make some comparisons and some critical judgments. Always a very nervous time. Some would leave in tears, as I'm sure they do today when they are criticized. Uh, Norman, I don't know if you can read it in the upper right hand corner. But an encapsulate there, or I, you can see there one of the earliest problems that Norman gave us. Very clear. First, type as a line, 
type as a texture, and type is changing form. Here's a farm boy from New Hampshire. First day of class, here's the problem. What am I to do? I thought letters were parts of words which said something. Now they are no longer performing that function. Shall I find a bus in New Hampshire? <laughs> From that point, I think the hair started to fall out. A very tough program, a tough problem. Less is more, make the students struggle and discover things they did not know they could do. And I don't know if, if you've all had that experience of going in and just saying, I don't get it. And that was certainly true for some of us at Yale. Um, so Esther took the picture somehow when we did a retirement program for Alan, she came up with it and we put it in the program. And I forgot that she had done it. It's Esther's work. And one of the only pictures that I know of Alan teaching or doing a credit. Pardon? Excuse me. Yeah. Uh,
say nothing. But in it was the idea that you can escape your own taste preferences by letting chance come into your life. A roll of the dice, pull things out of the hat before you make your choices. Easy to describe, hard to get quality out of that operation, but something that he said we should know about. And it was clearly something that John Cage approved in his own musical work at that time. Uh, need to talk about this. I hardly knew what figure ground meant before I went to Yale. But in the work of Norman Ives, it became very clear that the negatives were just as important as the positives. And it's very hard to get it to explain to anyone how to train what's going on here. But clearly there is a box grid, which is wonderful in itself. And then there's a secondary move, the diagonals. And Norman knew when to break the grid. And as you see at the very end of his career, it is hardly evident that it starts with squares, four by eight, or so on. But that, that in his life and in our work, observing that in his work over time was very useful, knowing when to break a rigid pattern and put something in it that suddenly brings it back to another form of life. Uh, Norman, bless his soul, if he didn't like the typeface, he would cut his own. He would draw his own here for a cover for a catalog of the Museum of Modern Art. Typo files, maybe David, you know what this typeface is. It starts with as a typeface. Norman has cut it, draw it, print it. And the other thing that I learned from him, try to express at least one dimension of the page, the width or the height. And you see that so frequently in his work when you go through his posters behind this, you know, make it clear that you have possessed taking command of the page, this way or that way or both. The last thing I can't show is he taught us how to sequence or at least make a spread. You put A and B. How do you make A and B work together? Is it large versus small? Is it dark versus light? Is it this versus rigid? He, the problems force us to face that. And that's the problem of anyone doing a catalog, time and time again. How do you make it an enjoyable experience, visually, to avoid you know, all the alternative? He gave the problem, and it's, a, it's very, very useful in my career, just to think about you know, how do we avoid a not in a border by putting two things together which don't really agree together formally. I think this is the one that will send us to You'll see this political poster on the wall. Norman did too. I'm very close. Okay. Uh, Toby Moffat represented the northwest corner of Connecticut. This was his winning image for his winning poster. You see Norman's initials in the lower left hand corner, NI. Not only was the poster a hit, but Toby was elected. And he was re-elected twice. And I tried to find a poster with Toby. He said it's one of with a friend, she won't sell it, but go to the Historical Society in Lichfield. They scanned it, gave it to John, and John recreated it. We seldom, we shouldn't forget that Norman worked with Herbert Tatter on the New Haven Mark for a railroad that's been defunct for 50 years, but it's still used on the commuter trains in Connecticut, the NH. John has a theory that that it was more than just Norman the Helper, that Normans might have had much more to do with the NH. Well, I'd like to add that Robert Kelly, I think, planted that seed in my head, so. <laughs> All right. Well, I put it along and come in. Right. <clears throat> but here they are, pulling the freight from the Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1955. Black engine, red detail, NH. We place the very floor in New York, New Haven, and Hartford River. So whenever you ride the commuter train in Connecticut, you see an age, think of Norman, think of survival, a mark for a railroad which is defunct, still being used because people love it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you.
I want to be sure and thank all of the generous sponsors for this event, uh, many of whom are here in the room, and we appreciate how far they had to come to join us. Uh, the Bailey Consulting Group, Charles Clark, John Hill, the Norman S. Ives Foundation, the McGregor Fund, Mark and Maura Resnick, Susan Thornton Rogers and Rick Rogers. Susan couldn't be here today, but Norman was her thesis advisor, and her project was a photography book. And he did just what, Norm, uh, what uh, Tom explained, uh, telling her how to sequence things. Uh, Tom Strong, Jack Weiss, and the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. And um, John, you wanted to come up and say a couple more things. Which is fine. We really can't leave without a few more thank yous, and these are very important to me. Uh, Bruce Meter has been such an integral part of this entire operation. He's designed for the posters and the book and the label and all that. And I'm really indebted to Bruce for all his help. And, and So we put microphones in front of all of the speakers so that now they can sit and answer questions. And I wondered if anybody wanted to ask anything about Norman, his work, or their presentations. The question was, do you remember, uh, do you have a list of... Was, he th was uh, John seeking certain things he remembered that he knew was significant? John, your mic works here if you want to use it. If you don't mind. Anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I, so, in some cases I knew things that we must include, but it really was a process of discovery. And a lot of it happened when I visited John Ives in Doylestown, and there I rediscovered, and I also discovered some things that I'd never seen before. So it was a little of both. I knew that they were vital things that, that I thought were important, but then I found the depth and all the riches that were there, and it, it, it's a little bit of both. Uh, can anyone speak to uh, Norman Ives' Could, would anybody speak to the relationship between Norman Ives and Joseph Albers? <laughs> besides besides the, the Albers portfolio that you'll see on the side of the room in the cases. <clears throat> Albers was no longer a presence in the school when we were there. Uh, he had a five-year term, and, which was not repeated. Um, as to, it was certainly a cordial 
you all know or probably been told that Norman took Joseph's course not once, not twice, three times. So he was a goner on, Norm, on Ives and, excuse me, Albers. Al, on Albers. Beyond that, I can only guess, but um, I never heard of anything but a cordial that John might have heard of other things I don't know about. He was the what? Yes, all the portfolios. Yes. He worked on all of the Albers portfolios. Close. And you see one of the, of the uh, containers here for the Abrams publication with Norman's type on the side. Interaction of color. You write the homage to the square, the second one, and the variants. All packaged, not packaged, I hate to use that word, but thought out as to how they will be put together with folders and the typography announcing each print. Yeah, it must have been closer than close. Inga Druckery has a Inga Druckery has a wonderful copy of the interaction of color. Is that correct? That she wants to give to the Cary Library. Oh, because it was signed by Joseph Albers and given as a gift to Norman Ives as a thank you for his work. Mm. <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing? I know I've wasted too much time. There is a whole world of co Norman's collages out there that we don't know that are not included in the show. Many, many private collectors in Connecticut and the Northeast own these. There's one, there's one order reporting. It was felt that we didn't have time and didn't want the legal implications of borrowing and insuring work that we hardly knew you know, much about. But I'm sure it's out there, so stay tuned. This and the book will bring things forward, both true, Al true Norman Ives and perhaps imposters, but others <laughs> will figure that out. I'm sorry, did I write? Write the book on Norman. No, I did not write my book on Norman. I am doing some writing. I have done a little bit of writing, but it's very inadequate. And I'd invite anybody that would like to help me write this to do so. <laughs> we tried, we um, tried. We now, are based on um, all the new material we have, I think we have a chance to make a much bigger and a much richer book. Yes. What would have been Norman's sensibility? Well, what would what, oh, what would offend Norman's sensibilities about type? Tell me again what she said. What would offend Norman what about offend yes, <laughs> type? <laughs> Just in terms of type. <laughs> well, I'm sure there are a lot of things that would offend Norman, at least as all of us, but I. There are probably so many that I couldn't mention them. I can't think of one specific thing that would have offended him. No. Hobo. <laughs> 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 Well, Inga was saying, do, if I understand it correctly, do I think that Albers inspired Norman and Cy Silverman to investigate one simple thing over and over again? And I think 
that that's very evident in one particular piece I mentioned it before, Reversed Grounds is a good example of that, where he took a, a, a basic structure and he made three iterations of that, a, a bar relief, a silk screen print, an acrylic painting, and then a very subtly modulated thing, looks almost as though Cezanne would have done it. But here's another example of his exploring in four, actually there are five of these, but there are four that are distinctly different. And I think that's one of the things that we all had learned from Joseph, that you take one simple idea, like a square, and you continue to explore it, and, and you, you're always amazed at what is there with this simple problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, Norman, some particular works have a kind of trance-inducing effect on um, his collages and, and some of his later letter form works. Did Norman ever express um, a psychological effect that he would hope to achieve in, in some of these other of his works? He ever go over there? You mean a aesthetic bliss? Yeah. Pleasure, pleasure, aesthetic pleasure. Well, I think pleasure, but he was a man of so many words, and I rarely, I don't ever remember him commenting on uh, his own work or what his intention was or what his evaluation of the final result was. We're very lucky to have in this case in the hallway here, thanks to Joe Watson, writing about eight individual symbols, and that is a rare thing for, 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 for Norman Ives to sit down and actually write about the process and what he meant in creating those symbols. And that would be the closest I think you could come to that. He was really not a, a man who write, liked to write about his words. He was like Picasso who said, if you have to explain it, it's probably no point. <laughs> Any others? Thank you to our panel, Tom and Jack and Dennis and John, for bringing all this information to share with you today. And thank you all for coming tonight.